week. So um, welcome. Hope you're all having a good month of July. Crazy how quickly we're getting to uh, the end of the summer and it's crazy how hot it is too. So hopefully you're all staying as cool as possible. Um, let's see here, what do we have on the agenda? Also, we're gonna have Oregon Buys uh, team provide an update. Um, we have a couple general updates from Darwin. Um, Chris uh, Wilson is also gonna provide an update. Um, let's see here. Darwin and John are gonna talk about expiring certifications in the requirements of procurement law. Uh, I'll provide some updates on, an, on, on uh, initiatives. Uh, we were gonna have Stephanie Lemhouse speak to the OPPA mentorship um, program as a, as a um, connected to the conversation we had last month about uh, mentorship opportunities, but um, she's on vacation. So we're gonna postpone that for next month. And then uh, we'll do our meeting wrap up. So let's go ahead and have the Oregon Buys team uh, join. Hi there, it's Nicole. So um, let me share my screen and bear with me. I've been having some technical difficulties today, so I'm going to do this kind of a, a different way, but we'll make it work. Okay, hopefully folks can see that okay. All right, so what we wanted to go over today, we want to give a project status update and talk about some supplier resources that are available. Um, we want to collect some stakeholders for a work group on confidential vendors. Um, we want to, again, remind folks about how to sign up to subscribe to our listserv messages for Oregon Buys. Um, and we want to go over a bug that exists in the system um, when searching and just make sure that folks are aware of that and then have some time for questions and answers. So with that, I will hand it over to Carter um, for a status update. Thanks, Nicole. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Just a really brief uh, status update. Um, we paused the project um, due to a system test that uh, determined that um, we weren't meeting uh, certain state um, requirements. Uh, PHI did make some system changes. Um, an independent third party retested, wrote a report that was reviewed by um, the steering committee. And after that, they, um, the, the executive steering committee said an August 1st go live day for our wave number one. Um, we don't have details on the, um, on, the, on the process dates for waves two and three yet. We're um, in the process of recalibrating the schedule. Um, so I'll take any questions on project status. Not hearing any, Nicole, maybe we'll just do the brief update on the um, supplier resources. So Amy's been making lots of communications out to our Wave 1 agencies to get them prepared for next week's go live. Um, in addition, she's um, provided uh, communication out to our suppliers and uh, the projects put together a number of supplier resources. Now they're available um, two different places um, that you can go to the Oregon buys homepage, scroll to the bottom and you'll see an icon um, that's called supplier resources for Oregon buys. And if you click that, um, that icon, it will take you to the Oregon buys project um, information page um, and a picture of that page is shown over on the right hand side so you can get to the uh, supplier resources um, directly from the um, from the Oregon buys project page. And I'll put that into the chat. Thank you Carter. So any questions on these? Yep. Any any questions on these resources? We do, um, if folks are curious to see what the vendors see, we do encourage you to go take a look. You can watch the videos as well and see um, what the uh, supplier experience is in Oregon Buys. So um, you're welcome to go check those out or share these with any of the vendors that you work with. 
Nicole, um, sorry, when when a question was asked about any timeline questions, I couldn't turn on my mic quick enough. Um, so just okay, to confirm, it sounds like we're recalibrating dates. This will include timelines for waves two and three. Um, um, do we have any estimated time frame for a wave two kickoff for that initial meeting? We're planning to get a good timeline put together by the first week in August. So within the next week or so, we should have um, dates for you. Okay, thank you. Yep. Thanks, Carter. Did we have any other questions on project status update? I want to give folks a moment to unmute. Okay, I'm not hearing anything, so we'll move on. Um, so next I wanted to talk about confidential vendors. So the way that um, that confidential items are um, handled in Oregon buys right now is there are there is current functionality to mark a contract as confidential, or you could mark like a department within your organization as confidential. So any of the contracts that are done within that are are kept confidential, but there is not a way to mark a vendor as confidential. And we have had um, one or two agencies ask about this. So what we'd like to do is put together a work group for agencies that might have this type of a need where they can mark a vendor as confidential. So what this could be, for example, um, maybe a vendor who serves as a witness or vendors who perform protective services that may be a target of retaliation by the public, something like that where like the vendors address or email or, or that type of information would need to be marked as confidential. So if your agency would want to participate in that work group just to sort of talk about the needs, um, please put put that in the chat so that we can collect and, and put that work group together. At this point in time, I just want to reiterate, we don't have the functionality in the system. This would be an enhancement request and most likely this would be a change request. Um, Oregon Buys is set up to be very transparent, so there's not functionality for this to, to occur today, but we want to talk about what the needs of the state are. So if your agency would want to participate in that, please put a comment in the chat and we'll collect those. Any questions on this before we move on? And I apologize the way I'm sharing my screen right now, I can't see the chat. So if anybody sees anything in there, please let me know. <laughs> okay. We'll move to the next. Um, so we wanted to circle back. I think we've shared this once before, but um, just to keep it fresh in folks' minds. So we do have an Oregon Buys listserv. And what we use this for is to communicate directly with our users on things like if there is for some reason system downtime or latency or um, any kind of anything going on with the interface. Most often we use it for quarterly releases and upgrades. So we send out information about the system's going to go through a quarterly release on the weekend and here's the updates that are coming in the release and some information about that. We might also use it to gather feedback and input from our users. Um, and so we do have a listserv set up for this. It's separate from the buyer link. It's specifically for Oregon Buys users. Um, the phase one um, ORPIN replacement uh, process, we did upload all of the system users in phase one automatically to this listserv. But going forward, anybody who wasn't brought in on that effort um, would need to go in and subscribe. So there is a link here. Um, when we're finished, I'll also put the link in the chat that folks can go sign up. And then again, we just pushed out communications. Um, those quarterly releases are the ones that we do most often. So that's very helpful to be able to go um, and get that heads up that something new is coming and, and see what that new functionality looks like. Okay. And then our last thing here we wanted to touch on, this was also in the newsletter that just went out that folks may have seen, but we are aware of a bug when searching in Oregon Buys, and this is only for users that are not logged into the system. So if you are logged into an account, this does not affect your searching. It's just for those folks that go to the Oregon Buys landing page and they do their search there without logging in. And so what we have found is that if you're trying to do a search for blankets, so you're trying to look up like a price agreement or a contract, um, this bug would affect the search results. 
And what's happening is that when you put in um, you put in a word, you put in something like that, it's not returning results. And so the workaround is that you can click on this little advanced um, option just to the oh, I'm sorry, just to the right of the magnifying glass. And when this comes up, you can check mark the include expired and then doing that will bring up the search result. It also does include expired things, so you have to pay attention to the, um, the end dates that are showing in your results, but that does then prompt the results to display correctly. Um, so we are expecting to see a fix for this in the next release, so um, that's due out to production in mid-September. So hopefully at that point in time, we will see the fix, but we just wanted to give folks a heads up for anybody who might be doing some searching without being logged in um, and isn't getting the results they expect. Any questions on this one? Okay. So with Nicole, that, that uh-huh. Sorry, there's no questions in the chat, but there's uh, a couple agencies that expressed interest in participating in the work group. Oh, thank you. Perfect. Well, and I'm going to stop sharing so that I can see the chat um, and just open it up for other questions. Is there anything else that folks um, have a question about? Anything you'd like us to touch on at the next month meeting? Um, or yes, if you would like to participate in that work group, please do put that in the chat and we'll collect those. So it looks like state police, medical board, and state fire marshal. Okay, we've got those, perfect. Um, okay, so I see a couple of hands here. Archana. Yeah, um, this is actually an email that we sent just uh, today, so you may not have seen it, but I did want to ask in, in this forum so that other DPOs uh, can, uh, can also listen to the response if you have any. Um, and that is that for in preparation for wave two and, and three, and we are in three, DOJ's in three, um, might we start asking some of our um, uh, access, you know, the, the, the ones who will be approving, um, I forget the name of uh, what that is, like the general access uh, users, might we start asking them to look at the training uh, that is provided in phase two already that you have uh, online. And I can see that it says, you know, for uh, wave one users or wave two users, but it doesn't say wave three users. But can we, can we ask our folks who are in wave three to start going through those trainings or should we wait because you will update according to what you learned from wave one and two? You know, that's a great question. I have not seen that email if you just sent that over, so I appreciate that. Um, we'll go back and have conversation. I'm not sure that there is a reason why folks couldn't start taking that training now, but let us go back and review and see if there's any potential updates, and then um, I'll let folks know. I can actually put something in the DPO chat offline so that folks get that response. Okay, I'd appreciate it. And if you can email um, Lowell too, uh, that would be sure. great. Thank you. Perfect, we will do. Thank you. Um, let's see, was that the only, I think that's the only hand up. Any other questions for Oregon Buys before I hand it back over to Josh? Okay, well, thank you very much for your time. Um, and I will send something out to those agencies who put a comment in chat so we make sure that you guys are included in that work group. So thank you very much. And Josh, back to you. Thanks, Nicole. I appreciate it. Um, Darwin, so you're up for general updates. Yeah, I think Chris and I are up next. So <laughs> Chris has got the big piece. Uh, mine is fairly simple. Just a reminder, everybody, that um, we've got uh, we got no procurements. We've got recruitments out there for a PCS3 in a number of them, about three. And we also have a recruitment out for a state procurement analyst, also three of those um, on the IT team and also on construction. So, and we're, there should be another one going out here soon for a PCS2. Once we get those all hired, we'll be at full strength. Um, a few DPOs have received a call from myself or Kelly 
to discuss workload and prioritizing work that has come in. And I want to thank those DPOs that we've spoken with and, and their staff um, of being understanding and working with us. Um, I really appreciate the ability to work together there. And I think that's all I have, and I'll turn it over to Chris, unless there's any questions. I, I, I do have a question, Darwin. Sorry. Uh, this is Archana. Um, can you just explain what the difference between the PCS3 and the state procurement analyst positions yes. are? It's fairly simple. Um, state procurement analysts uh, conduct statewide procurements. So that's anything dealing with NASPO or any statewide agreements that are put in place. That is the primary difference. Thank they you. Can enter in and solicit for statewide procurements, highly complex items. Thank you. Josh knows that. <laughs> and the level, and then the level or the, uh, yeah, their their level is slightly more than the state procurement analysts. Because I think PCS threes are uh, what, like a 28 or something? They're 29 and I think uh, state procurement analysts are 30s. So it's Thank not you. that big a difference. That's. So it's like a, like a, um, a, a operations policy analyst um, yeah, position, three position, OPA three. Thank Possibly. you. Yeah, I don't know what the pay difference it, differential is, I, but I, I don't. Thank you. Uh huh. Any other questions? All right, Chris, I give it over to you. All right, I'll take it away. So you have to forgive me. I'm actually at a conference right now and I'm trying to I snuck away to finish my part of the presentation so I wanted to make sure I did give a solid update and so um, I wanted to do two things today I wanted to give you an update of where we are plus introduce my team I might have my team actually introduce themselves so that way you don't have to hear all the background noise constantly uh, but I'll give you the quick update on uh, what we're doing with the disparity study and where we are so we're in negotiations with the top proposer. Tomorrow we have the kickoff meeting with the top proposer that uh, was selected through uh, the uh, uh, the process, and we had uh, involvement from the governor's office, from our DPO council, uh, and from DAS procurement and uh, my little uh, section. And so we really came up with, I think, with a solid uh, uh, vendor that will create really good research for us and we really set our disparity study apart from some of the other statewide disparity studies that you may have seen or heard from. And then also, you know, one of the key differences to the statewide disparity study is that we have to remember this is very different than a DOT type study or even the FAA uh, disparity study. So if you're hearing um, um, different types of disparity studies that they are uh, that people talk about just know that the statewide disparity study just runs a little bit different and you'd have to look at the nuances of the dip, the types of disparity studies but we're going into this and I'm really pleased about the progress we'll be able to make and uh and about some of our next steps so with that being said, I, we are fully staffed and I wanted my staff to introduce themselves. So I'm going to actually call them out and if you could come off on mute and introduce yourself real fast just for 15 seconds and tell the folks who you are. So I'll start with Dr. Michael Mazura. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, my name is Michael Mazura. I am the Oregon Disparity Study Operations and uh, Policy Analyst. Great, Michael. Thank you. All right, Deborah Benavides. Hi, I'm Deborah Benavides. I'm the strategic initiative analyst to the disparity study, and I'm also going to be the contract administrator for the statewide contract. Perfect. Thank you, Deborah. All right, Alexandria Straub. Afternoon. I'm Alexandria Straub. Um, I'm actually our remote research analyst for it, and I am based out of Minneapolis. Which is a good thing because Minneapolis and Minnesota have a great program. All right, I'm going to go to Joshua Smolik. Hi, everyone. My name is Joshua Smolik. I'm currently a student at Michigan State. I'm going to be a senior, and I'm one of the NASPO interns here with the state. 
which is fabulous. NASPO, um, I'm at a NASPO conference right now, learning so much more about uh, procurement, procurement process, and having Josh on board really is how we develop our future for procurement and within our program. And so I'm really excited about having Josh as part of the program. So Dr. Deanna Grimstead. Hello everyone, um, I'm Deanna, pronouns are she and her, uh, research analyst um, in my position and a PhD in anthropology with specialties in DEI, uh, quantitative and qualitative analyses. So hopefully that's will be, will be useful in uh, as we go along over the next year or two. Thank you. Right, and Deanna would say she's our hard scientist. <laughs> so she, but really proud to have Deanna with us. And last but not least, Candace Joyner. Hi everyone, I'm Candace Joyner. I use she, her pronouns. I am also a research analyst and I am a PhD student at OHSU School of Public Health and Health Policy. So I don't know if that makes me like the soft scientist, medium, somewhere in the middle. Thank you. So yeah, I'm very pleased with our whole team. We have a, a great uh, uh, deep bench of, of intellect, of, of research uh, ability and technique. Uh, a lot of us come from academia. Um, uh, Deborah Benavides is, has significant state uh, um, experience working with ODOT. Uh, Alex uh, also uh, is a veteran like myself, uh, has worked in uh, uh, health administration within the Air Force and also on the private sector. And, and everyone else has been able to do research in social sciences and anthropology and all these other great things and in education. So I'm just really pleased to have everyone on the team moving forward. And uh, I'll leave the last piece. I know I didn't take up very much time because there's not a huge update, but are there any questions about our current process, about anything that's going on? I'd be willing to take some questions now if possible. Oh, Chris, silence is always golden. Yeah, science means that I did a great job and that I'm awesome. So perfect. All right. Thank you, team. Oh, thank Chris, you, everybody. I, uh, Chris, oh, oh I, go ahead. I please. do. I do have a question. This is Salema Payton with Water Resources. Um, yes. Do you have a a website up yet where we can tap on any information or um, that your division may have that might help us in our struggle we, to develop we do not have a website yet okay we don't have a website yet we will soon we're bringing on the vendor and part of that is will the vendor host the website or will we host the website with inside the state and so okay. that's going to be part of the process and there'll be ongoing updates and and um and we'll have to be very uh, very clear as we interact with uh the community with uh state agencies and also with uh external stakeholders so it will be significant for all of us to uh have that communication device but we don't have it yet and i was going to say one one thing you just reminded me we plan to have the contractor the vendor in place around september so as we negotiate the final pieces of the contract through this month um the beginning of september we should have that vendor in place and so we should have some more information to share and update everyone with yeah, thank you um, um most importantly uh if uh, we can have a, um, a any mode of uh, access to your division and mm -hmm. or how agencies can access your division, as you know, we're all in the uh, process of developing that area of the um, um, agency participation and development of the high programs. So yes, um, we're looking forward. We're looking forward to working with you guys. Yes, and I'd be pleased to work with you, especially on the program and. The program side, we're working really on the research side first and, right. and the disparity studies, you know, is is laying mm -hmm. the groundwork and the significant foundation to actually move into. Specifics mm -hmm. to our program, so whether that be um, some kind of set aside or a percentage or whatever it is, or mm -hmm. if we yeah. do something else, all based on what we find in the numbers in the research. Thank you. No problem. You know, we have another question. This is Archana. Um, just to, how long? How long is this project? The study of, of this pro this project as a as a study 
Um, and, and what is the goal, goal actually in the end? <clears throat> Currently, the from when the, the study starts, it's due to take about 12 months. The goal is to have Oregon specifically ha measure what disparities we know of and then also be able to act on those disparities with the cover of the courts. That's the, the, the key difference. We can create programs, but they can be undone without the disparity study because that satisfies many of the federal court requirements. And you may know that, I don't know, I, but that's that's really what the end goal is, is to really have that legal foundation for um, uh, Oregon procurement equity program. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. And I know that sometimes that, and that this is my last spiel. I know that sometimes th that the study will move slower than what people want, and the the study mm -hmm. won't won't uh, change all of the inequities that we see um, in some of the things that we experience. However, it will allow us to do um, significant things that will have stick to them. They'll be able to stick. And that's the one thing that's key to especially the statewide disparity studies and especially what the states have already created uh, their programs after they completed the study. Yeah, so that was a that's interesting to me too. So you're looking at or have looked at other states that have gone through this process and come, came out on the other side uh, more, more progressive or more available resources for those who are disadvantaged. Mm -hmm. um, so what 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 states were they? My uh, some of the, the states that we've looked at, we looked at all the states and our researchers have actually created a small database on uh, some of the statewide disparity studies and also the DOT disparity studies and large municipality disparity studies, which are all kind of different and nuanced. But what we've seen, and especially I give the example of uh, uh, the Minneapolis or the Minnesota program, where they've done the disparity study and, and, and some of the examples that they've done after the fact is they've created uh, percentage thresholds uh, for agencies uh, in expectation, I believe, of 6% uh, of their spend needs to go to uh, certified firms. And another program that they created uh, there is they increased their uh, their threat, their bottom threshold from, I'm not sure uh, what it was, but it went up to 25,000 if the agency contracts with a certified firm. Mm -hmm. Things like that, they're really specific that they can do, but with the cover of the study. Otherwise, it could be uh, undone as unconstitutional. Or, yeah, not constitutional. I'm not a lawyer, though. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Um, I work for DOJ, so I totally understand. <laughs> and I'm okay. not a lawyer either. <laughs> but OK, thank you so much. All right, no problem. And that's what I got, unless there's any other questions. I don't see any. Thank All you, right. Chris. I appreciate it. No problem. Uh, so Darwin and John Kolcheski, um are up next. Yeah, we want to take some time to talk to everybody because uh, I'll just use DAS as the example. In our own office, we had people that weren't in the office, weren't paying attention to their certifications, and what happened, their certification expired during COVID. Um, we've been pretty lenient, but that's going to end here fairly soon. Um, if someone would have applied for their certification, at the time that they should have, and they had the points, um, we will probably, I'm not saying for sure, but depending on everything that's there, we may reinstitute their um, OPBC. However, there's one problem, and that's procurement law. And in the procurement law, it basically says, and the agreement was when this is all established, was that if you maintained your certification in good standing, didn't let it expire, um, you never had to take the new principles. However, it's expired. Sometimes to some people up to two years. 
um, you're going to have to take the principal's class uh, to meet the requirements of the law. And I want to remind everybody of that. So please reach out to your employees. Make sure they look to make uh, see if their certifications are still good. And it, if not, let's have these discussions now since I've had a lot of them here recently. So and I'll share our office. We had numerous expirations too, and some didn't have the points and we won't reinstitute their certification. And I want to make that real clear. If you don't have the points at the time you would have recertified. Your certification will not be uh, put back in place. We will consider it and we've been pretty lenient and we'll be that way for a, a short period of time, but that's why I'm having this conversation now so we don't run into this a year from now. A year from now, I'm, we're probably not going to be as lenient. OK. So. I have a question. What's up? Um, the question is the exam apparently, at least for the basic, comes around maybe twice a year. Is there an opportunity for those who need, want to take it, you know, sooner than just to, you know, it, 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 the next one? Well, my one of my staff wants to take it sooner, but it's in November. Is is there a possibility to just get online and take that sooner than wait uh, until November? It's uh, really is availability of our staff to be there to proctor that exam. Um, so I think the best person to answer that is John, um, since he works and he actually proctors one of the exams. So John, are you on out there? OK, I am. he's not here. I am. I'm here. Oh, OK. All I'll yours, John. Figure out which mouse to hit which button. <laughs> uh, yeah, we've uh, basically we've scheduled all of our trainings, in, including the certifications, uh, to occur three times a year. Uh, however, if you have someone that wants to take uh, the the exam, or even if you have a bunch of people that want to take a class uh, beyond those three that are scheduled every year, uh, just contact my, myself, and I will go ahead and pull the instructors. And I'm sure, especially for a certification exam, we'll be able to find one of us that would be able to uh, proctor that for you. So yeah, just get a hold of me with the uh, how many people you have, and I'll go ahead and get a hold of an instructor, and we'll see what we can do. Thank you. I'd I'd really appreciate that, John. Thank you very much. Yeah, no problem. That. Looks like we have there. a. Yeah, we have a question from Michelle. Hi everyone. Uh, hi Darwin and and John. Uh, thank you again for the for the class. It, you know it, it helped. But I I just want to make sure that everybody understands. And and I was one of the people who ran into um, a a dilemma of um, my certification expiring. Fortunately, I did have my hours and all my contact hours, everything I needed, and I did take the class. Um, and you know, I passed the class and I got reinstated. But I want to be sure that people understand. Back in 2018, there was a change um, through the legislature that required that that our certifications could become five years rather than three. So, quite honestly, I had you know my error was my understanding was. Our certifications, everything prior to that was superseded and that my certification was good for five years when in fact it was still only good for three years. So I had a misunderstanding about that and I also had went to some of the classes and trainings um, prior to that when the when the um, law first came into effect and that was still my understanding at that point, which is why I didn't pursue it before now. Um, so I just want to make sure if you have people out there that might have that same thing going on for them, have them check it. If they had an original three year certification, it is only good for three years. It only starts the five years um, from the new from the time of the of the new law. And is that correct, Darwin? Um, I'm not sure the exact date, but that is. Probably more than accurate. John can probably give a better answer on that because I'm not sure when it went into effect. 
I believe it was 2018. Um, the statute yeah. was passed prior to yeah, that. Yeah, the new so. statute was in effect 2000. But I just want to try to help someone out yeah. that if that's their situation, just have them double check it so that they don't run into that issue. Um, fortunately, you know, I would all I had to do was take the class and everything's fine. But um, it could you could run into a problem if you if you let it expire. Um, it, it you know, so I just wanted to share that. Thank you. That's real helpful. And I, like I said, I just want to get this out to all the DPOs so you, you can get with your staff, make sure that they actually check their certifications. And if we have an issue, let's start working it now. Um, you can send initially to John because John will review it with uh, the staff and then get back to me and we'll get with Kelly to get a final decision. So bottom line is, is this. Um, please reach out to your staff. Make sure that uh, they actually check their certificate. So if they took and had a certification prior to 2018, they probably have a three year certification and not five. OK. When we developed this with the DPO Council, the training required by law, um, we decided that it, it could be a five year um, and everybody in the DPO uh, leadership team agreed to that. So that's where that came from. But what really is important in the statute it states what we must teach and the new principles class is that class that meets that requirement and, and that's what gives you the ability to conduct a, a procurement so it's very important that you maintain your certification or you'll have to take the new principles class okay any other darwin, questions darwin there's a few questions in the chat Looks like Salim is the first question regarding this topic. OK, there's a couple of questions about how do you check your certification? That's a problem, and thank you for asking that question, Salim. Um, we used to have a, a website that was out there that you could actually log in and check. Um, tried to work with DAS IT to actually keep that site up. Uh, it didn't meet the security requirements and we have not been able to get the staff to rebuild that site in a more secure um, ability for you to do that. So the site won't go back up. However, Anya is the one that actually is tracking that. So if you want to send a note um, to Anya Corbett and ask her, she can provide you that information. She maintains um, the information on certifications for everyone. Okay. Real quick on that, Darwin, have we checked into seeing if Workday has any kind of feature that? No, it does no? not. Okay. <laughs> Workday has some nice features, but it does not have that ability. And we've had a lot of questions, um, a lot of questions from DHS on that factor, and it does not. Um, it'll track your learning events, it'll track your training. The other thing is if you take training outside of what's in iLearn, um, remember employees can self-report and upload information and in, into, um, I want to say I learn, um, workday learning. So make sure if they take training, that's, and if you have trainings that you take outside of the organization, please fill out the form, send it to John so we can review it and add it to the list as either OPPT or other type training. It's important if it's OPPT because then you get the full credit. Um, so remember, those are important things also to remember. Anything else? Did I miss any of the questions? No, I no, think they're I all. Think that was it. Yeah, they're all centered around how to find out. OK, thanks, Darwin. Appreciate okay. uh, the information. It's helpful. All right. So I'm next on the agenda uh, regarding our uh, DPO Council initiatives um well what can we report 
at this point, my understanding is there's not a lot to report. So the class and comp um, uh, work is still trudging forward. Um, last I heard, um, I think from our last update is DAS and uh, DAS procurement and DAS CHRO are still um, looking at where we're at in that process. Um, DI and procurement efforts. Um, more to come on that. We're still trying to assemble a team. So we've had a few people offer to help. Um, we're looking for a chair. Um, so if there is uh, anyone willing to step up as chair, we would uh, really appreciate that. Um, if not, we have some ideas, but, um, but feel free to contact me um, or Amber to let us know if you're so interested in uh, a chair role for that subgroup. Um, and the only uh, other thing is uh, I'm hearing, um, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail because uh, there's not, not a lot of detail to share, um, but I'm hearing that there's going to be a updated executive order at 1803, um, and it's going to provide uh, information about um, uh, how we can support the DEI efforts through our procurement and contracting uh, actions. So uh, just be looking for that. I, I had understood that that executive order was supposed to come out end of last week. It did not. I'm not sure of the timeline. I just know um, it's coming. So just be looking for it. Um, Obviously, I mentioned at the beginning of the meeting that the OPP uh, a mentorship overview uh, will be discussed. And and John, I I saw your uh, comment about a mentorship program uh, through DAS. I'm going to circle around and get some clarification before I speak to that. Unless unless you want to, uh, we've had some conversation in the past uh, in in a past meeting about this. So, uh, what is it? What is it you wanted to mention regarding that? No, I just thought, you know, I don't know if you were aware of it. I've been working on a, uh, a management and leadership program for DAS procurement services. And as part of that program that we're going to implement at DAS procurement services, uh, we're going to be implementing the DAS mentorship program. And so depending on what you're looking for, uh, rather than go outside of the organization, if this one would meet our needs, uh, it would probably save us a lot of time and money. Definitely. So let's schedule some meeting for you and I and Amber to talk about what those um, options are, and then um, and then and then we can uh, still look at maybe having a presentation, whether it be from OPPA or 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 you. Uh, on behalf of all the agencies. So there's there is definitely some expressed interest from our last meeting when we were talking about the concept and and I can go into more detail about um, about some of the thoughts that were expressed. So. Um, but rather than. Uh, duplicate duplicate the commentary, I'll just I'll table it, have a conversation and then we'll bring it back to this group uh, when we have more. No problem. To speak to. I'm digging in for some more information too. So let's see, it's 2.30 and we're about an hour ahead of uh, where we're expected to complete. So uh, this is good. Uh, this gives us some time to talk about agency happenings and roundtable. Um, before we get into the agency happenings and roundtable, there were uh, a couple items that were brought up during the exec session that I wanted to make sure we carved out some time. Uh, I will start with saying uh, congratulations to Shirley Smith for your TPO um, position. Uh, welcome to the group and um, and wanted to wish you luck. So everybody, when you get a chance. Um, Congratulate Shirley. Um, and then Kathy Jones, um, you had a question about uh, DAS SLAs. Did you want to talk to that a little bit? Uh, sure. 
Um, so I, um, I was looking through our past agendas and I must have missed it. Was not one of our DPO council objectives was to look at um, process efficiencies within DAS and how that um, how that plays out and increasing that. Is that it was not one of our initiatives anyway. If so, it's tied to the SLA. Um, and I was looking at section five of the SLA and Darwin or anybody else from DAS. I don't know if we have it on our radar to update that SLA. I, I can answer that very quickly. Kelly has already briefed out uh, all the directors that we are looking and reevaluating and reviewing and going to redo the SLA. So the one specific item that you're referencing to reference organ buys, a lot of that's all going to be cleaned up because the SLA is going to look much different. And that's been discussed with your directors already. Okay. Is there is there a timeline on that, Darwin? Do we know? Do not. Okay. Kelly has given the timeline to the directors, and I do not remember with everything else going on what that timeline was, but it, it's going to be later this year. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? Uh, Darwin, before we move off of that, and you probably don't have the details, but is it expected that fees are going to go up or just a kind of a cleanup, like you said? Um, it's just the cleanup. Um, the fees will change, and that's done by analysis uh, with uh, budget in DAS. Yeah. So the fees change based on um, the analysis of what it takes to pay for us to maintain our employees. And just so everybody knows, most of our spend in our section is employees. There is really nothing else that we have that is strictly employees. Um, supplies and services is small. Other things that's pretty small. DOJ is probably the next thing that's large, but our employees, and that's what the fees go to pay is to, uh, to maintain our staff. Okay. Any other questions on that before we move off? Got to hand up somebody does. Uh, Michelle, it looks like you have your hand up. I do, and I it's it's not do um, it's a different question going back just a little bit on the specs and comps um, that is in review and and DAS is still looking at. It feels like that keeps getting pushed back. Do you guys have a timeline when you're hoping to have that complete? Is that for next biennium? So if you're asking DAS procurement services, we're at the at the same mercy of the situation. But I right. will give you some the insight that I've gained over the last few years is that the union really drives that review. Uh, and so if the union feels that a class needs to be reviewed, that's where a predominantly amount a, a large amount of the focus goes. So is that changes with the unions that may change the focus of class and con. OK, we started this way back when we started in 2000 before 2018 and actually got some distance and then all of a sudden it was put on hold. And so I I, I know about as much as you do. <laughs> yeah, that's why I keep been hearing about it for so long and I keep thinking, is this really going to happen? <laughs> Do we, have project, do we have project managers assigned to each of these initiatives? I mean, um, is that like, is it HR? Is it what's who's who's leading the, the pack on these things? So you're talking about from the standpoint of within the work group of the DPO Council or uh, who we are speaking with from, let's say, CRO, CHRO regarding class and comp? Yeah, yeah, just I think um, maybe just my ignorance of who if the DPO is leading it, is DAS leading it, is CHRO so, leading it? Regarding class and comp, um, it's my understanding that Kelly Mix has taken the lead on that. Um, I'm not sure if if Kelly has um, delegated that responsibility within the DAS procurement team um, to work with CHRO. 
No. I, um, I heard anything, so. Okay. <laughs> and I, who would he normally delegate it to? Yeah, and and who we're working with <laughs> over at CHRO, I, I'm not sure. Um, I, I don't know. I I'd be remiss to say I, I feel like we should have a little more leverage than what it appears that we than it appears that we do because of the fact that this was one of three key initiatives that the governor's office was in support of when the governor's office had said, hey, agencies, what are some big issues for you over the year 2022? And we said, class and comp. We really exactly. need some support there. So I am not exactly sure why. I mean, I understand there's new programs being uh, developed as a result of uh, the last two years and the craziness um that we've all been hit by it but i feel like if the governor's office is um is standing by those needs that we've expressed it seems like we, we should get a little bit of attention so that's just my perspective I'm not right. speaking on behalf of business oregon with that perspective i'm just saying i yeah. i think we should have a little bit of leverage there yeah, so maybe we need to talk to Kelly because if it is on the DPO Council to organize and move these things, um, I don't want us to drop the ball. Um, but if it's if it's DAS owned, I honestly don't know if it's DAS owned or DPO owned. And so um, I'm willing to help out wherever if you need me. Yeah, that would Thank that you. would be great, Josh, if you could could let us know just so we know where it's moving from. But one more thing um, that, that sure. wasn't everything, but I did want to speak to um, just quickly on the mentoring program, John, um, you know, it might be helpful to also include Stephanie Lemhouse because she is the president of OPPA and um, OPPA has a very robust mentoring program and it might be valuable to understand like how they work, what they're doing, what makes it, and maybe you could use some of those things for the state and then we can use obviously maybe the state mentoring program, but giving you something, a good start, you know, to move it forward. So I just wanted to let you know that um, she's the one, I know she was supposed to present today, but she'd be a good one to to bring in the conversation for sure. Agreed. I think uh, even if we were to look at a hybrid, I think more resources uh, might be better with this. So, Yeah, I thought you were talking about, Josh, you were talking about getting us three together anyway to talk about it, right? Yeah, we will. Yeah, so yeah, I'll do more research on my end to make sure I've got everything down. All right. Let's see. So um, one more question that was uh, addressed during exec session was um, Archana and uh, opportunity for delegations. Did you want to talk to that or speak to that? Yeah, um, Darwin, I know that, you know, I've I've sent a request and we're meeting up with Kelly, yourself and Norma in August, sometime in August to discuss a blanket delegation for some some of our projects coming up um just like odot has had for a number of years now um so is there anything that you could speak to just on a general level for a, other benefit of other dpos um you your office obviously has um staffing uh challenges right now um and so we're sort of looking at that as well and with all the other projects that are coming down the pipeline for doj we we simply can't wait you know um to to have you do your recruitments too and and i don't know how long that that takes but we we need to kind of move forward with some of this so can you speak to just that in general um i mean i've been hearing through some folks too that das is uh, more flexible right now um because of some of the challenges they have internally to um on providing or granting delegation authority yeah i i can talk to in general in general um 
we've always entertained delegations, um, but with the current workload that's coming in and it's massive across the organization, um, as you all are probably experiencing the same thing, there's a lot of money out there. Everybody's flushing money and they want to buy things. So. Yeah, a lot of that workload is coming our direction uh, and every one of our sections is overwhelmed. IT is more overwhelmed because we're short personnel and we're working to remedy that. In the past, we. Based on things that had um, legislation, so on and so forth in the past, delegations and IT were not considered. Um, however, they are being considered. There is. Will not promise anything. Many people put in delegations and they don't get them. But here's a couple of things of insight for you um, to keep in mind. When you send a delegation over, make sure the people that you have that are going to actually do the contract administration have required, met the requirements under statute. If you have someone that's going to conduct a procurement, make sure they've met the requirements under statute. Those are first and foremost, the most important to even begin. OK. The other thing is to realize with delegation, um, that means that you're going to have to meet a certain level of certification and those certifications were in discussion and as a blanket certification that ODOT and DHS and forestry have those delegations and that amount that's given to them, they also have certification requirements that they must meet. OK, so keep those things in mind in general. Yes, we are considering and will consider all delegations, but the biggest and most important thing is you have to go into Oregon buys and actually submit the requisition with the supporting documentation. OK, but those are some key points to keep in mind if you request a delegation. And just because we have a conversation does not mean that the delegation will be given. OK. Is that helpful? Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Uh oh. <laughs> Go ahead, Sandy. Sandy. Trouble's about to speak, right? <laughs> Actually, Archana, I just wanted to bounce in and let you know I'm working on your delegation request for Atmosera right now. <laughs> <laughs> you. <laughs> You're welcome. You yes, much. we are. We are. We're definitely looking at the delegations and speaking from the assessment and recommendation perspective that we do as the managers here at DAS. Please make sure that we are getting complete information on these requisitions, because as we do our research um, on a contract, its amendments, how was it put in place? These are all these things that need to be looked at while we're doing the assessment. We're checking on the credentials for your staff that are proposed. If we don't have that information, it really does slow down the process for us as managers trying to get it in front of Kelly with our recommendation. So um, please, please, please give as much as you can in Oregon by so we can work through them as quick as possible. Thank you, Sandy and uh, Darwin. I see a couple of related questions in the chat. If you want to take a look, I think starting with Sharon Domashowski. I was going to mention too, and I don't know if anybody said this because I'm sorry, my brain was halfway in a delegation and halfway listening here. Um, if folks recall, we are looking at changing the thresholds, right? There's supposed to be some temporary rules change that change the thresholds moving forward and that's going to affect what your agency can procure versus um, going straight for a delegation. So that's something else that we're looking at alleviating some of the pressure on DAS and being able to through rule delegate through those threshold changes back right. to the agencies. And if I'm speaking out of turn, Darwin, I'm sorry. I was just yeah. thinking about that process too. Well, the, the process is, is that the Haskell legislature first and right. the legislative concept is being developed. There is no guarantee of this, but um, we have pretty wide support in this process and DOJ is. We've had good conversations with DOJ. Um, I'm not going to speak for DOJ, so 
in those conversations, it, nobody has raised up any flags and said, no, this make, doesn't make sense. It makes perfect sense with the current economy. It makes perfect sense that it hasn't been looked at in many, many years. So the adjustment in the thresholds, um, a $10,000 uh, contract is nothing anymore. Um, so, so you didn't talk out of turn, Sandy, but um, definitely is some the legislative concept of moving forward. Okay, so with that, um, the question that expected time. Um, there is no expected time or reference. It all goes back to what Sandy and I had stated earlier. The more documentation, the more support that's there and ensuring that those other items, the certifications and so on and so forth. Um, principal public procurement has been taken. This contract administration of course has been taken by those individuals. That speeds up the process. If we have to go back and ask for information, it takes much longer. If we have to have more than one meeting with an agency, that extends the time. So having as much information supporting documentation um, with that delegation is very helpful. Or being concise in your description so we can find what you're referencing in Oregon Bias or Orpen. So there isn't a expected turnaround. We work them as soon as they come in and as quickly as possible with other workload. So I hope that helps. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else on delegations while we're. All right. Don't see anything. OK. Uh, Thanks, Darwin. Yeah. All right, so roundtable. Um, any anything uh, anybody wants to mention for the good of roundtable? Any agency happenings? And see a hand up, Derek. Hi, y'all. Um, I just wanted to share that I recently endeavored uh, an experiment um, <laughs> in procurement, and that was hiring technical assistance providers to assist with application writing and submission. And it was kind of an interesting endeavor. So we, we had a pretty large grant opportunity for community-based organizations and workforce partners and big pot of money about 10 million bucks and we wanted to really encourage and support community-based organizations that aren't as sophisticated as big workforce development boards or universities um, to really compete for these funds and so we we did a uh, intermediate solicitation for technical assistance providers we initially intend to only hire one um, but we ended up hiring three and so far it's been a really worthwhile process. They've, it's <laughs> taken a lot more work than I expected at the outset, but they really helped engage people that approached them. And basically we, we put them under contract before we issued the request for applications for the opportunity for the grant. We included their contact information in that document and allowed anyone and everyone to contact them with questions about eligibility, um, assisting them in developing and revising drafts and submitting um, their application. And I've been really happy with the process. I The reason I thought about that is because Metro had done that many years ago um, as well for contract opportunities to get better uh, proposals. And so I thought, I thought it was interesting. I think with the new initiatives to push for uh, you know, COVID certified firms. I, I think this, you know, we will be using this uh, more frequently as funding allows. We we fortunately had up to $150,000 to to pay for these three technical assistance providers. And I know that's not always the case for every agency, but 
we're going to try and keep carving out this money as as we can. Thanks, Derek. Any other agencies? How are your recruitments going? Seems kind of hit or miss. Well, we interviewed three this morning. Two more interviews tomorrow. We'll let you know who we're poaching from you. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, good luck over there. Um, I, I have the reason why I say hit or miss. I mean, I, I had a recruitment that in the past I would have expected 25 plus ended up with 10 opened it for one more week and then ended up with 25 but then I had a different recruitment that ended up with uh substantially more than expected I, it's kind of I don't know it uh I'm I'm having to temper my expectations on on uh what we get but um, and I'm trying not to steal from any of y'all, so take that for what it's worth. So on our latest PCS3 recruitment, I will share that it was our third attempt um, to fill multiple PCS3 roles throughout DAS procurement services. Uh, HR chose to do a little different uh, recruitment for us, and I was game for us to try. Um, and we had roughly 89 applicants, which then got screened down through a video recording round one um, to about 17. Uh, most of those folks were living outside of the state um, and were uh, finding the hybrid option as something potentially appealing. Um, we whittled that that 17 has landed now just to the final five that we're conducting interviews on right now. And a lot of the experience that we saw coming in on resumes was primarily supply chain management and logistics, that type of purchasing. Um, so that's a little bit of feedback for the latest PCS3 recruitment. We'll just continue to do what we got to do to get folks in the in the the right folks in the seats to get the work done. That's really the goal. I have a question. This is Archana uh, on the recruitments. I, I also have one hanging right now. Um, um, if they have state procurement in another state, that is of course something that we can consider, correct? I mean, it's it, uh, to, um you know and this is this again sort of goes in sync with what we're trying to ask for in our delegation too because you've got to be of a certain level to conduct or administer these contracts and when you only have a pool of five or six applicants that you're looking at and none of them really are you know state folks from the from Oregon State right from for procurement um, and some of them might have you know private supply chain experience procurement experience but not public um, and then maybe you have a few that are coming from another state who have public um, experience um, I would think that that would be um, significant um especially when when you're looking at providing delegation to darwin i mean we can't wait around for them to just have oregon state procurement experience right i mean that would that would be like two three years i mean what's what's the what's the level for pcs2 i mean uh well, you've got to have I, two or I three years i think you're confusing certification with um the issue of the procurement law and the basic requirements. Okay. Uh, we we hired two people, private sector. Yes, it takes them time to gain the experience and gain the certification. Um, but we we've hired a couple from the private sector, the state procurement analysts, and they're doing great. 
Um, but they immediately got their principals class and they were able to conduct procurements. We trained them with other state procurement analysts and they're doing excellent work. Okay, so thank to you. eliminate people from the private sector, I think we're um, yeah, harming we're ourselves. Good. Yeah, well, and thank you for the clarification. I mean, I, I, I just needed to understand because it does say, I think in some of these, the, the, the rules, um, you know, these folks have to have Oregon procurement um, experience. Um, so I just um, I just wanted that clarification, um, particularly if they're wanting to pursue, you know, larger if, if we're needing them to pursue larger contracts or thresholds. Um, I, I was under the impression that they needed to have a certain amount of years of Oregon procurement, but it doesn't well, sound Unless your PD calls that out, um, our PDs are fairly generic and uh, call out procurement experience. We don't call out a, a specific. We ask for people to have a certification, whether it's national or. Or in Oregon, but the point is, is that does that. Preclude us from hiring them? No, because it's. Yeah, it's a I'm, desire. Right. Item, but if we have somebody that's highly qualified from the private sector and it means that we're going to have to train them, absolutely, and we've done it more than once. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh -huh. So there's quite a bit of chatter uh, in the chat about uh, how we're hiring uh, regarding remote versus hybrid versus, um, you know, full time. Is any agency requiring full time? I mean, no judgment, but are we are we in a position to even uh, require that at this point? Um, but I, I can tell you what I'm hearing is interesting and also, if I'm being honest, frustrating because I wish there was a little more consistency um, amongst agencies and a little more guidance about how to how to navigate this um you know i can i can say our agency is in a situation where that although we are flexible and we're very flexible in oregon you know we're our agency the mission of our agency is to support oregon businesses and i think there's a statement to be made if we are hiring uh, out of state employees, um, you know, come do businesses or in Oregon, but we don't necessarily live in Oregon. So uh, I, I can tell you, our agency is taking a very tactical approach to figuring out how to how we want to navigate it. Um, but we are um, we are hiring um, a lot of hybrid employees um, and. Um, you know, I, I particularly am requiring my staff to come to the office at least twice monthly. Um, I am curious, though, what, what other agencies are doing it. I imagine the more flexible you are. You're offering another competitive advantage that maybe another agency isn't. Um, but it's. It's uh, definitely interesting times. What are some thoughts? So there's a couple of questions, Josh, about people working out of state and hiring out of state. I have two uh, trainers that live out of state. Um, there are requirements you have to work through HR, um, and they're instead of putting TCM on their um, payroll, they put TCE, which is for out of state. So are there issues that can come up with that? absolutely are. Um, Don Engelmeyer, one of our managers, lives out of state, lives in Washington. So for us at DAS, we can get the work done. We don't really care where they live. <laughs> so, and most all our work can be done remotely. There was also some questions about pre-bids and so on and so forth. During COVID, 
um, dash how we got around it was the project manager and we utilized phones and and ran videos and posted videos. There are many other ways that we could accomplish that task. Probably not the most efficient, but there were we could accomplish the task even during COVID. So I hope that answers some questions. Any other thoughts? I suppose I could read through the chat here a little bit. I I did mention, you know, one one point of discussion is or one point of consideration is the fact that um payroll and benefits and and tax requirements are different between states. In fact, uh if I recall, there's a discussion about um, there's one particular state where we would prefer that they not, if we were to go remote, there is a state or a couple states that we would prefer not to allow a 100% remote situation. And I can't remember which state that was. I don't know if, I don't know if it's Texas or what, but. It might be California. I know that there's California, maybe. an issue. It's very tax. I'm currently in yeah. California. And I know that it's um, there's some type of, you know, like it's very tax intensive. Oh, yeah. I'm reading through some of these. Yeah, so Shannon just saw that. Uh, that's that's what we were uh, considering, too, with regard to personal tax. Um, anyway, well, I mean, Gosh, at the end of the year, I imagine someone could take on writing a white paper and hopefully at some point um, DAS um, could provide some lessons learned and, and further guidance on this. I think right now what I'm hearing is it's up to the agencies. Um, so anyway, all right, well, any other topics we want to hash out before we end this call? Yeah, how do they participate in trainings and conferences? I mean, right right now, most of the trainings that uh, we're taking are remote anyway. I don't know that, I mean, I know NIGP, I mean, if you're talking like NIGP conference, um, there's some in training there, but that's a good question. Chris, I see your hand up. Yeah, real briefly, if you can hear me um, at the NASPO conference and speaking with other uh, procurement leaders uh, in different states, and we have an advantage in our state where we allow some workers to be remote and not be in the state, where so many other states, they don't have that and they're desperate for employees. And so it does give us a slight competitive edge when we're looking at um, human capital, but I just wanted to share with that 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 was a common reoccurring theme. I'm hearing all the pain from everyone, but that's what I heard all week from everyone else from all the different states is that uh, personnel and recruitment have been very, very difficult. But again, we have that slight advantage because I spoke with so many other states and they just they simply there's no political will, no no leadership will to allow the employees to uh, work out of state, let alone some of them uh, to not work from home. Uh, uh, so there's several states that are really in a bind, uh, Missouri being one of them, that's where I am, uh, where they don't allow any of the employees to work from home. So uh, it does create uh, uh, a, a disadvantage to uh, state procurement process because the private sector is not doing that right now. So anyway, I just wanted to share with that. Yeah, that's interesting. And I I, I think that some of those states are going to get left behind where they're going to lose good talent to other states. But I actually think that although we're inconsistent in how we're hand, handling it in the public sector, we are still fairly progressive and and um, competitive with the hybrid environment. 
I'm I'm seeing a ton of out of state applicants. I I would argue um, this last recruitment about a third, not quite fifty percent of my um, of my applicants were out of state. So that was interesting. And the other thing I've noticed because I've had a couple recruitments that I've I've picked up on this. I've had a lot of uh, applicants that have been coming from the medical industry. And and I was curious about that because I was talking to one of the applicants uh, just to kind of see what what's causing that. And, and they had said, well, speaking for themselves, um, they think there's a lot of volatility in the medical industry and and it's insecure right now. So that's interesting. So. All right, uh, any other chat items? Agreed. Uh, Melissa, we allow it, but there is a cost depending on their type of working remote versus hybrid. I've also had employees asked to move, but keep working remotely and want to travel reimbursement. We're, we're quite a, our agency is quite a ways off from wanting, having any appetite to do travel reimbursements for 100% um, remote, so. Yeah, the only thing I'll add there, Josh, is remember, um, I think it's a statewide policy that addresses this. It states that if the person comes into the office more than eight times, then they should not be considered remote. There should be a discussion with the employee whether they're really remote or hybrid, if they mm -hmm. come in more than eight times in a year. Mm -hmm. um, yes, there is a cost associated with um, if we require the employee to come into work. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, we understand that, but work-life balance, we've already been doing it for two years, just going down the list. And mm -hmm. I'm sorry to hear that, Melissa, I had somebody thinking that they could snicker the system. It's unfortunate. Well, you know, and maybe a topic for the future um, is I'm, I'm curious what some agencies are doing with regard to their leases. I, you know, we leading into this year, we have a lease that was due to be renewed and, um, and we've renewed it, but with the concept of, hey, we need to kind of play this out a little bit and and see what 2022 looks like um, before we make any decisions to change our lease status. And so I, I imagine there's going to need to be some strategy uh, going into 2023 and 2024 on on how we arrange our lease agreements. Downsizing, uh, there's going to be uh exit clauses maybe need to be more flexible i don't know all right well uh this was a really good conversation um thank you i hope you have a good rest of your month uh if you have any questions or concerns or um, anything regarding updates that you need to know just send me an email and amber or i will respond as quickly as possible uh y'all take care you too thank you all right, bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, Josh. Thanks. Good job.